In this day and age of high quality compact video cameras such as your GoPro or your Sony RX100 which can shoot 4K video, high frame rates and even log formats, why are TV cameras still so large and expensive? Hi I'm Grant and for those of you new to my channel, thanks for stopping by. This channel is all about shooting video and reviews and gear and tips and technique gleaned from my 20 plus years of shooting professional video. A really common question I still get asked often when I'm out on jobs and I'm using one of these big dogs is why are TV cameras so large and expensive still? Now this camera is not mine, I borrowed it from a good friend who is a professional shooter here in my local area who has been shooting professional video even longer than I have. Now most of my experience on these large television cameras is for shooting sports, rally TV shows and sometimes news or magazine styles of shows and predominantly I still have to use these large beasties for that style of work. Also I've just spent the last two weekends shooting motor racing for a production company here in New Zealand and again we were using large format television style cameras for this job. This was to produce a television show and they were also live streaming out to TV and a Sky network from all the multiple cameras that were used in this production. Now I've got a couple of shots that I shot when I was out actually out doing this job that I shot with my tiny Sony RX100. And for this job, I was using the Sony HXC FB80. Now the body on that camera alone was worth US $16,785. And the lens was the Fujinon 22x7.6 lens. Now that lens was worth $23,477 US dollars. And then this was all combined and sitting on a Miller tripod which was worth approximately $5,000 US dollars. And for example, on that job alone, I was only one of the many cameramen placed around the motor racing circuit that we were shooting. And that rig that I was using was worth US $45,262. And that doesn't include batteries, wet weather cover, road box for storing and transporting the camera and other ancillaries that you still need for shooting these styles of television productions. So why are TV cameras so big and expensive? Firstly, Professional gear is made, and look at this one here. This has seen some miles. Professional gear is made to be used and beaten about all day and every day if required. And more often than not, it is used in conjunction with other professional cameras. So it, it is a camera that has to be picked up and used without any glitches such as overheating or buffering or any other sort of reliability problems that you may get with cheaper consumer style gear. TV cameras are professional tools that are made to be used day in, day out, and they will give you consistent results all day, every day. Another thing about these big beasties is that they have been engineered and designed to adhere to broadcast quality standards. Now broadcast quality standards is a bit of a throwback to traditional broadcast television. However, they are still, or they still have standards that these cameras must adhere to. Now broadcast quality standards are also beyond my level of understanding, but they are basically engineered an engineered set of standards and requirements for broadcast that these cameras must meet in terms of their minimum standards. Here's a quick quote from a Wikipedia explanation of broadcast quality and it is relatively low compression analog recording or digital recording capability with little or no chroma subsampling and the ability to be gen locked. That's quite a mouthful. Now another reason that television cameras are so large and expensive is their lenses. Now these lenses are often worth more than the body of the camera and here's a couple of reasons why they are still large and very expensive. They often have a large focal length with a very low constant aperture. So for example that Fujinon 22 times lens I was referring to earlier which was the one that I used on the motor racing, that has or that combined with a two third inch broadcast camera which is also what I was using that has an approximate crop factor of 3.93 so it has a zoom range with a 35 millimeter full frame equivalent of 29 millimeters to 656 millimeters. Now that Fujinon lens also has an optical two times extender so that will take it out to a further 1312 millimeters so 29 millimeters to 1312 millimeters in 35 mil equivalents. 
that is some zoom range. And also before using the two times extender on the camera, it has a constant f 1.8 aperture. Once you use the extender, it then goes to a f 2.5. That is still amazingly fast for such an amazingly large zoom focal distance or range. Now another requirement for broadcast television lenses and just about all lenses on these styles of cameras is they must be parfocal, which means that you or to, ach to achieve sharp focus, you zoom the lens right into the subject that you are recording, get, set your focus, and then you can zoom out and zoom in, and that, that object will remain in sharp focus. And that's how you set focus on these, these large style lenses. And of course, the lenses being so large, they have lovely big, big focus barrels and iris barrels, and even a manual zoom barrel if you want to do a crash zoom. And this makes achieving focus and minute adjustments very easy with such large and smooth focus barrels. And of course, speaking of zooming, the lens also has a power servo, which means it has a smooth mechanical zoom rocker so that you don't have to touch the actual lens barrel. You can also change the speed of that zoom and it can also be controlled remotely by a zoom remote and focus remote if required. So all of these professional features come at a price and often this price is about the price of a relatively decent secondhand car. Now of course professional TV cameras also will have professional viewfinders or even external viewfinders that they can or monitors that they can attach to the camera and these help you achieve sharp focus and correct exposure. These viewfinders often have features such as peaking, contrast and brightness to, to adjust the viewfinder which all helps you dial in your eye to get correct and sharp focus and exposure every time. Not just sometimes, every time. Now this brings me to another feature of professional cameras such as this, and that is they have a lot of your controls for shooting video on the exterior of the camera. They have the controls such as your ND filters, white balance, shutter speed, and other such things, all on the exterior of the camera. This saves you from having to go in or diving into the menus of the camera to try and change this. So it's a lot quicker and it's a lot more efficient when you know where all these controls are on the outside of the camera. Now this brings me to another feature of these Sony cameras. Now I've used many professional Sony cameras over the years and their controls are just about always in the same place. So what it enables you to do is when you jump from one Sony broadcast camera to another, you will jump straight in because you know the controls are all in the same place. The ND filters are generally in the same place. They're controlled for your viewfinder or your white balance or your shutter or your record on and off, your zoom servo remotes. They are all virtually identically placed and now enabling you to jump from camera to camera very quickly. Now another reason these cameras are so big and what makes this a professional camera is their or their ability to have many different inputs and outputs attached to the camera. For example, during the motor racing I just did, I had an external power cable plugged into the camera so I could leave the camera switched on all day. I had an external microphone plugged into one of the two XLR audio inputs. And in this case, I also had a fiber optic cable plugged into my camera, which fed my camera's pictures back to the director's control truck. This gave the director sitting in the control truck access to all the different cameras around the racetrack and the ability to live cut the motor racing event. Also critical to this is that I also had a pair of headphones or intercom headphones plugged into my camera, which enabled me to talk to, or that more importantly, the director was talking to me, telling me what shots he wanted and when, and I could also talk back to the director. Another feature of, in this particular case, in the motor racing and using these cameras is it had a feature called return, where I could basically hit a button and then look through the viewfinder and I could see the live show as it was being cut or as it was being recorded in real time. So I could see what picture the other cameraman were, were shooting or if they were playing back a pre-recorded piece, I could actually watch it and listen to it through my viewfinder. And of course, as I alluded to earlier, all of this extra equipment and size means weight, which means that you need a sturdy and large tripod to handle all this weight. And being video, you want a fluid head tripod. And to handle this, for example, this is probably six or seven kilograms right there. So it has to be a sturdy tripod with a really good fluid head to enable me to get smooth pan tilts. More cost. Now where this sometimes comes into conflict, for example, I shot a, I was one of the cameramen on a reality TV show shot here last year. We shot these on the Sony FS7, but the, by the time that they added the a Canon zoom lens, a matte box, I also had a battery plate 
for the V-Lock batteries, I had a transmitter so that the director could see my pictures, and I had an audio in and a locket box on the camera. This camera now became really long and really heavy, yet these were still, well, I still had to use this camera in tight spaces, I had to move around, we were on ski fields, we were inside in the house shooting these people, but this rig was about, if I can get that in the viewfinder, about that long, and probably about the same weight as this camera, so you really felt it when you did a day shooting on that rig. A smaller lightweight rig would have been much better for that job, but being professional, being a professional production, it required to have all those accessories, such as a video transmitter, XLR audio in from the audio from the audio people. Also, it wanted V-Lock battery, so I had to have a V-Lock battery adapter on the back of it. So it grew from a relatively compact camera to a relatively large camera, but that was what the necessity was for that television production. So to sum it up, TV cameras are large and expensive for three main reasons. Number one, professional tools, as in any industry, have to be able to be picked up and used and beaten about all day, every day, without missing a beat. And number two, they have to have the ability to have other external features attached to them, such as video and audio input and outputs, external batteries, external, len external lenses, and other things which, again, make them a professional tool. And thirdly, because it is a fairly niche industry, they don't have the economies of scale such as, for example, a Canon DSLR or a Panasonic camera. They don't produce the same amount, so then you don't get those price advantages of mass production. So that's it. Those are my thoughts on why TV cameras are still so large and expensive. I hope you enjoyed the video. Like it if you did. Subscribe if you aren't already. And I will see you in the next video.